should be live now. Okay, we're live this hour, joined by PhD candidate and project coordinator for the Ottoman Greeks of the United States project at the uh, Samuel Proctor Oral History Program or housed at the University of Florida. We're really, really excited to be joined this hour by uh, George Hopolitis. This is a real big honor. I, I had the honor of meeting this gentleman a few years ago, and I was really, really excited to hear about his project. Um, and I want to get into that. I want to get into that. But first, George, I want to ask you, how did you, how did you, um, like, why are you doing this project? Well, how'd you get, how, what sparked the interest to, to, um, to do this project that you're, that you're involved well, in? First, I'll say that the honor was all mine when I met you. Uh, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to meet you when you visited at the Samuel Proctor History Program and we got to talking and, um, you know, I'm just a big fan and I'm, I'm really happy to be called upon to, you know, talk about my work. So I, I really, I really appreciate that as, as well. Um, yeah, uh, so it, this project is really something that kind of is linked to my identity to some, to, to some degree to a great degree, actually. Um, I'm a first generation immigrant uh, to the United States. Um, my uh, parents were first generation, uh, I'm sorry, second generation um, in Greece. Um, so my grandparents were first gener generation from the Ottoman Empire to Greece uh, in the early 20th century. And, um, you know, I, I, for my whole life growing up, you know, I was told stories at home uh, about you know what life was like in the parts of the Ottoman Empire my family is from, which is which overlap with um, you know contemporary Turkey, the contemporary Turkish Republic, uh, and specifically the northeastern part uh, on the Black Sea. That coast is where uh, pretty much all my family's from. Um, so I was always told stories, you know, about what life was like, or what my grandparents had told my parents life was like there, um, and then what their lives were like in Greece you know, with what they experienced growing up as children. Um, and, you know, I, I learned very young, at a very young age to kind of identify um, as an immigrant, to identify as um, a des the descendant of immigrants, a descendant of refugees um, you know, in Greece. And I, try, I always grappled with, like, what that meant for me um, in the United States. Um, and how that identity really impacted me directly now as a first generation immigrant in the US and second generation like removed from Greece really but you know as a second generation uh, uh, of descendant of immigrants to Greece um and you know for the for the longest time growing up as a kid it was just the top, you know, a topic of conversation at the house, you know, here's what happened, you know, I remember this story every so often something would come up, you know, on Greek radio or something that we had, we were connected with at home, <laughs> you know, and we would listen to Greek radio or uh, later on we were connected to like Greek television, uh, you know, um, through, through cable and uh, then later satellite, you know, the home uh, uh the home version of the satellite dishes came out in the 90s late 90s early early 2000s so we were connected to like greek tv and you know ever so often there would be documentary or something about you know the the events uh in the early 20th century in the ottoman empire uh discussions about genocide of of you know greeks armenians uh, syrians uh at the hands of um the ottoman state um, in the early 20th century. And we would always, you know, conversations would always like, you know, begin, <laughs> you know, whatever a documentary would go. My father would start talking about it. My mom, you know, they'd go back and forth about, you know, their experiences, what their parents told them. Um, but that's what, that was it. It was just like a topic of conversation. I studied, I went off into a different realm uh, uh, for, my, for my career. I, I went to school um, in, in Connecticut and studied in um, in the sciences in biology and then microbiology and actually worked as a microbiologist uh, for about a decade, a little over a decade, um, teaching and also working in the profession. But this was always like in the back of my mind, you know, always a topic of conversation still. Oh, it's just like nagging at me. Um, but I never knew what to do with it until I went to a, um, you know, a lecture at the University of Connecticut uh, where a professor uh, 
from Greece had visited and gave a, a talk about the uh, crypto Christian uh, population of, of Turkey, you know, um, as it existed in the past and remnants of it at the in the present. Um, and I was I was very intrigued by that talk. So I approached him, you know, and I said, I would like to probably ask you a couple of questions about this. And we got to talking and he said, you know, you seem pretty interested in this and pretty knowledgeable. You know, nobody is really looking at this bit of research in the U.S. context, you know, uh, just kind of think about it. He goes, go maybe take a class. He goes in history, you know, see how you like it, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and at the time I was like at the very beginnings of my career as a microbiologist. So I said to him, you know, I don't know. I don't know if this is something that I can do right now, you know, because I'm just starting out. I just finished school. You know, I, I don't really know, uh, if I'm the right person to do this. Um, but he said, nah, you know, it, from what, from, from our discussion here, it seems to me like maybe you should take a class or two and see what you what you think because yeah you what you know he goes you're starting out he's like it'll be easy just to go back to school <laughs> you know, you know? i'm like yeah sure yeah, yeah of course it would be i think um, i think that historians artists people in the humanities are very selfish they, they, they <laughs> want to see something happen and they're like well it's not going to happen without you so you know, forget your life <laughs> <laughs> forget your ambitions yeah <laughs> like, uh but you know what? It, it came at a time where, like, this was always still at the back of my head, too. Um, so I was like, eh, let me take a class. <laughs> you know, let's see what, let's see what happens. Uh, so I did. I, took a, I went back to, back to taking a course at, in, um, and the, it's interesting. The first course I took was U.S. history between two wars. So between World War I and World War II. Um, and, uh, I was given the opportunity there by the professor whose name escapes me right now, but, um, you know, to, to write a paper about immigration, Greek immigration to the United States. And that was my first foray into actually the data sources that I I'm now using, you know, for my dissertation. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of glad I went back, <laughs> you know, I'm kind of glad, glad that, that it was that particular class. Like it could have been any class. So I see it sort of like this serendipitous moment, you know, um, for better or worse. That's the way I, 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 I see it for myself. But, you know, it just so happened that this class was available that semester. So I was like, all right, let's see what, what we'll make out of this. And I was given the opportunity, like I said, to study immigration in that course and to write a paper about Greek immigration and to come into contact with a lot of the data sources that I'm even using till this day to do my dissertation. Um, so that's sort of, you know, the roundabout way I ended up finding what my passion, uh, what my passion is. And after that point, after I wrote that that paper, and you know that fo the following semester I was accepted into school, it just there was no turning back. Like it just slowly but surely, uh, uh, the the historical data, the searching, the you know the the discoveries, little by little, it just it just took over, you know, I couldn't even focus that well on what I was doing as a microbiologist anymore. You know, all I, all I can do is like try to find time, you know, to, to focus on this, to try to focus on, you know, acquiring more information on analyzing it, you know, on learning more. Um, and it really became like a personal um, search for my own identity too um, in the process. So uh, yeah. Um, after after you know my initial coursework you know and doing some more papers and some some more research ultimately i, I um uh graduated and then uh i freelanced for like three years i couldn't get into a phd program i was rejected like three times by three different schools uh on consecutive years uh and finally the university of florida <laughs> You know, I persisted. Uh, this wasn't going away. It was. It's like I'm not quitting now. Oh no! You know, it's like I can't stop doing this. Like it just took. Like I said, it just took over. I, I just couldn't stop. Um, yeah. And uh, finally, the University of Florida gave me the opportunity to uh, to pursue uh, to pursue the project further. Um, and after three years of coursework, uh, I could safely say that you know they complete. Not only did they give me the opportunity to work on this project, 
but the classes I took uh, have, um, you know, to a certain degree, completely changed my 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 view and my my lens of viewing society, uh, both in the U.S. Uh, and globally. Yeah, uh, and I am so grateful for that uh, because honestly, prior to my to my work, uh, uh, prior to my classwork, I mean, uh, and in learning how to use sources, uh, in in really getting acquainted with like the um, broader uh, um, coursework and really learning, like I always, I you know, it was my project was so limited, right? It was only looking at a specific immigrant group, those experiences. You know, and 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 just in connection, I would always connect it to myself. So you know, it was always like this limited view of immigration. Uh, and thankfully, through these courses, through this coursework, I was able to broaden my understanding of what immigration to the United States actually means, and the specific position of the immigrant group I was studying within that broader story. So um, you know, in 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 uh, comparison to. Uh, Mexican immigrants in comparison to uh, African American migrants from the South in comparison to other European immigrants to Asian immigrants and in comparison to in the indigenous nations of the United States like what does it really mean in comparison to those experiences uh, you know to be a, a Greek immigrant in the United States or to be an Ottoman Greek immigrant in the early 20th century really like what is the position of that immigrant group and I learned so much you know, I learned that, you know, for example, you know, it's a small immigrant group, you know, um, and it, in terms of like the level of oppression that uh, it, it experienced in comparison to other immigrant groups, just minute, you know, uh, present, important, you know, uh, points in, in, uh, of oppression with, that these people experienced, but nowhere on the scale of, you know, what, Mexican immigrants uh, experienced of, of what uh, African American migrants experienced and of, of what native uh, uh, tribes experienced during the same time period, you know, that the, the Ottoman Greek immigrant group was entering the United States. It just gave me such a good perspective, you know, and really positioned, you know, like, here's reality, you know, here's what this immigrant group, where they, where they fit in the broader story, you know, uh, um, of, um, U.S. history during this time period. Um, so it can, like I said, it completely changed my my the lens of focus, the way I viewed them, the way I viewed myself. Um, uh, also, um, and I think that was that was very that was very important, and it continues to like um, it continues to impact me and influence my thinking and my my understanding of uh, theories, concepts, uh, and the way that I do my my work from from since then. Um, you know, and the way I understand the, the data now, since then, um, just completely different. So I'm, I'm grateful for that, uh, for that perspective. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, I, I want to get into, um, your act, you know, some of the, the findings and the, 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 the findings of your work and more delve more into like what, 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 what it actually looks like. But I am curious to talk a little more about, your own family history. So you 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 mentioned your your family are refugees from uh, from you know like the days of the Ottoman Turks or or kind of the the, the formation of the, the Turkish Republic. Can you can you talk a little bit more about that? Like why why did they feel the need to flee Turkey? What is now yeah. Turkey? Into absolutely yeah absolutely. I'll talk specifically about uh, my own family. You know they uh, both sides uh, as far as our our oral history and our in our in our home. Um, mm -hmm you know, has passed down to me. Both sides fled uh, towards the end of um, the genocide of Greeks in the Ottoman Empire. So they, they left towards, um, you know, in the years around 19, I, I, I don't know the exact years that, 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 you know, that hasn't gotten passed down to me through oral history, but um, just from the stories that I've been told of how the family left, uh, that they boarded boats, you know, at the and it, and my father specifically telling me and my, and my mother that they that it was towards the end. Like those are their exact those were are were their exact words, you know, that the families left towards the end of that genocide. Um, so they literally fled, um, and what they were fleeing was, you know, a a, 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 a repressive government that was targeting them. Um, targeting them specifically for their identity, their um, uh, 
their ethnic identity within the uh, Ottoman Empire, their um, their religious identity within the Ottoman Empire, uh, and really make you know just giving them no options to stay, pretty much. Um, that's that's the oral history that's been passed down to me. Uh, I've since been able to contextualize it with readings and all that, but you know, in, in terms of like my own family history, that's how they fled and the stories about. You know, my uh, my on my father's side, uh, one of the um, the siblings of his of his father, you know, being thrown overboard because they, they died on the ship on the way over from the northern uh, part of Turkey um, to uh, to the northern part of Greece, uh, for example. So you know, the the baby you know died in during the journey, and they had no choice but to throw the baby overboard. Um, and I found from my research that this was actually a pretty common uh, occurrence during this time period. You know, there was a lot of, there were many different uh, illnesses uh, that were rampant during this period, uh, you know, of exodus and exchange. Um, and ultimately, you know, a lot of, there was a lot of death just on, just from the journey over. Um, but yeah, so personally, you know, that's one of the stories that has been passed down to me. So they, they were fleeing a genocide as far as I'm, I know, and I'm aware from my, from my parents, uh, from my parents' uh, renditions. And, um, you know, they, they go to Greece and institute themselves in two different parts of Greece. My father's side in the northern part of Greece uh, with the help of uh, the, uh, since doing my research, learning with the help of the Greek government, you know, and, and loans from the League of Nations uh, and the Refugee Settlement Commission of Greece, um, you know, they were given plots of land uh, and they were given the right to uh, cultivate the plots of land in Northern Greece and Southern Greece. They were given, in the beginning, you know, they lived in in shanties and, and tents. Um, uh, and this isn't, this is not part of the oral history of my mother, by the way, but that's, this is the story of her side of the family uh, being sent to, to Southern Greece, specifically in the regions around Athens. Um, and they settled there and, and, um, you know, they were basically directed there to some degree too, as refugees by the government to specific, uh, um, towns, uh, and her, her, um, family, uh, settled in, um, a, a suburb of Athens, a suburb of the port of Athens, Piraeus, uh, the town is called, uh, the suburb is called Drapezona. Um, and, you know, that's where she grew up. Um, in one of these, you know, pre-made cookie cutter homes that were given to uh, refugee families uh, from the Ottoman Empire. My father's side, like I said, were given plots of land in northern Greece, um, and they built homes. Uh, or in some case, I think my, I don't know for sure. I think my family built homes, but I'm not certain about that. They didn't share that much information with me, but I'm. I'm pretty sure they built homes versus being given homes. Other families were given homes uh, that were vacated, that were, that were vacated by expelled Turks during the Balkan Wars um, a decade earlier in the, in the 19 teens, uh, 12, 1912 and 13 uh, to be specific. So that's how they end up in Greece. Um, and, you know, they meet through family members and arranged marriage and ultimately I'm born in Athens um, you know, decades later, <laughs> decades later in the, in the early, in the late seventies. Um, so I grew up in Athens half my life. Uh, and then because of, uh, partially because of economic instability in, in Athens in the eighties, the late eight, mid to late eighties. And then also partially because of my, uh, father's ambition to send, um, all of us, his sons, three sons to school, you know, we, we moved to the United States. Um, ultimately to have uh, my, the middle brother or my middle brother and myself, um, you know, have more opportunity to go to school and advance uh, to upper level education here in the United States. That was, that was the, the motive. Um, and, uh, you know, we moved to Bridgeport, Connecticut, which in the late eighties was a very interesting uh, city to grow up in, say the least, um, you know, very, um, Diverse city, for sure, but a former World War II city. I've learned, you know, since then, and the industry and, and a deindustrialized city that had lost all of its, you know, economic uh, um, 
capability, I guess, like for lack of a better word, you know, to provide jobs. Um, so Bridgeport, you know, very, you know, went through this phase, like a lot of other cities in the United States, of just being decimated, uh, you know, by um, the politics of the time and jobs just not being available and you know uh, falling into extreme poverty in, in the starting in the 70s and in the and into the 80s and early 90s and we experienced that i mean we saw how how the city kind of declined overall um and we were there for the whole you know for the whole duration of that decline um i went to school there um and ultimately you know went to college my my father had a um he was a the sole proprietor of a business in a poultry sh shop uh, in Norwalk, Connecticut, uh, which is a city about a town about 30 minutes away. Um, and, you know, we grew up in Bridgeport and I went to school in New Haven. Um, and ultimately, uh, you know, that's that kind of rounds out the story of the family and how we, we ended up where we are. So. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's kind of it's it's very interesting to 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 think about this uh this particular question in the U.S. context because, you know, I think about things like uh, you know, you know, I was trying to look at look at trajectories like so like in the early 1900s, you have things like the Greek Town Riot where people are just massacred, pushed out. You know, that, that's one thing. Um, I remember hearing Zach Galifianakis talk about how his uncle was a politician, and he ran against I think Jesse Helms I think it was, okay. and Jesse Helms ran against him saying you know like. Uh, Vote for Jesse is one of us, right? Meaning this golf Canakis character. Yeah. That's the seventies, right? Yeah. And then, like I think to like the two thousands or wherever you have like, you know, I don't know. I mean it's hard to, it's it's the, the I mean this is gonna I don't know, this is my own ignorance, but the best example I can think of is like my big my big fat Greek wedding is this big cultural touchstone. But but the idea behind it is that Greeks are different, right? You wouldn't have like my big fat Dutch wedding or my big fat Right. You know, like Yeah. Yeah. You know, right. like, yeah, there's there's definitely so so there's definitely like this reification that the the Greeks are different and she's marrying this 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 quote unquote American guy right who's like Anglo something or other and so he there's he doesn't come from a tradition he doesn't come from a culture he's normal she's marrying a she's marrying a normal guy and it's so embarrassing mm -hmm. and then by the end like oh no culture is great and the normal guy can find his way whatever that's that's the moral of the story but like again it's this normal guy here's my embarrassing culture. Um, so there's still like these remnants. I mean, that that's that's different. You know, a movie like that's different than like a, a town being wiped out. But there's still, yeah, really persists. Yeah, so, so to speak to that a little bit, I, this yeah. is part of what my research kind of looks at. You know, it looks at these narratives um, and stereotypes um, that are specific to um, immigrant groups. Uh, so not and and migrant groups, and also um, uh, resident groups in the United States. And what I mean, by, so I'm referring to, I'm generalizing here, but I, what, I'm, what I'm really referring to is, you know, indigenous Americans, African Americans, Latinos, and um, European and Asian immigrants. Uh, and I'm still generalizing and saying that, so I completely recognize that I, that I am. Um, but I think that there are stereotypes and I think that the stereotypes and narratives that we know of for all of these groups, you know, have that component in common of you know, being viewed as the other, of being viewed as inferior in one way or another, and the stereotypes being used to, um, you know, project this inferiority uh, throughout U.S. history at one point or another um, for certain groups, um, and, you know, Greeks being one of these groups, and uh, Ottoman Greeks, who I'm, sp who I'm specifically studying, you know, being one of these groups where you know, in the earlier, in the early 20th century, late 18th, early 20th century, you know, it was, it was a very pronounced uh, um, uh, dis disparate differentiation, uh, uh, othering uh, of that particular immigrant group, along with Jews and Italians and, um, you know, Latinos, other immigrant groups as well, and, uh, Asians, uh, I can, I can go on, <laughs> you know, but all, basically the, the, this very dominant hegemonic white you know, uh, um, you know, heteropatriarchy, to use one of the terms that I've learned in school <laughs> since uh, since starting my program, you know, um, and um, that um, that and that othering 
um, over time through assimilation, you know, uh, being becoming less uh, prominent for certain groups than others. And that has to do, and you know, again, according to a lot of a lot of the readings I've done, you know, it has to do with basically the people, you know, perception of people, um, you know, the color of their skin, uh, their their phenotypic characteristics, also the way they, you know, the any um, um, you know accents they would have, the way they speak. You know, there's all kinds of information out there about you know, as long as people keep their mouth shut, you know, they're they're considered white, but then they talk and, you know, their, their accent, you know, makes them non-white basically in the, in the, in the view of, uh, the dominant quote unquote mainstream, uh, culture of the United States. Um, so, you know, I, I, you know, using those two examples, I would go a bit further back to the early 20th century and say that, you know, Greeks amongst other immigrant groups in the United States, you know, had that, had that component uh, in common, you know, being, being othered, being, you know, seen as inferior, um, and stereotypes surrounding, uh, and, and buttressing that inferiority, uh, in the, in the, um, in the perception of quote, again, quote unquote, mainstream American society, or whatever that means. Um, and ultimately, you know, that is kind of where it ends as far as the, the similarities are concerned, because in be, in building like counter narratives uh, to those stories, to those stereotypes, um, you know, these groups, Greeks being one of them, Ottoman Greeks being one of them, were able to kind of, um, um, no pun intended, migrate away from that, that othered position um and doing so doing their best really to build narratives that you know increase their proximity to the whiteness of mainstream uh american society um you know so presenting themselves as industrious and you know um the content the con the inheritors of you know gl glorious ancient greece you know these are all narratives that uh, were very common commonly used in the early 20th century. Um, and in some cases are used in the present as well, you know, to kind of help buttress and again, uh, um, increase proximity to whiteness uh, when, when, when a threat or you know, a perceived threat emerges, you know? Um, so uh, yeah, I think that, but, but I think that that's where the similarities end. Right. I think that uh, if we look at things like you know, all these, all the material uh, aspects of oppression uh, that, you know, um, African Americans, Indigenous Americans, Latinos uh, have experienced uh, and compare those to like, you know, segregation and housing and schooling. And, you know, we, when we compare those to like the Greek experience or the Ottoman Greek experience uh, in the United States. I mean, there's there, this is actually one of the things I'm researching, by the way, I'm trying to, I'm trying to dig, you know, to see if, if there are similarities in that realm as well. And so far, what I've been able to, to find, you know, is not, it's, it's indicative of what I'm saying right now, pretty much that there is this disparity, you know, and the experiences are completely different. And, you know, Greeks and Ottoman Greeks, uh, along with other uh, um, European immigrant groups, as a lot of the literature has already stated, you know, that's out there, um, just didn't have that that's that um, that sim that much similarity with Native Americans, with Latinos, with African Americans, and in, in in being discriminated against. Um, uh, but they do have that. What's interesting to me, though, is what they have in common, and this is what I try to do. Yeah, through my own research, not the project. I mean, this is not the, the goal of uh, the Ottoman Greeks of the United States project uh, at the Samuel Proctor World History Program. That that project has separate goals, um, uh, and you know, part of the, we'll talk about the project later um, uh, as we as we proceed. But um, my own dissertation, you know, uh, actually tries to look at these issues um, and tries to uh, compare to some degree experiences. Um, it will, it will try to, I hope at least to compare experiences and really, really position the Ottoman Greek group, um, 
you know, within this broader context of immigration to the United States in the early 20th century, you know, and, and hopefully help people understand, you know, where this particular group fits uh, in comparison to others, um, as far as, you know, their, their othering was concerned, as far as, you know, um, stereotypes and, and discriminatory narratives are concerned. Uh, that's what I'm, I'm interested. That's what my research is interested in. Not the project, <laughs> but my, my, my own research and my own dissertation. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that there's a real interesting question of like a, of a, of a you know, a periodization of United States history, right? So there's pre-World War II and then there's post-World War II. And we're talking about 20th century. It's pre-World War II and post-World War II. And post-World War II, we see things like the GI Bill. We see the, the massive infrastructure built up of the, of the suburbs, et cetera. And so in that way, I think we can like, we can, we can, we can see a difference between before that, in which Greek town, like the, the most obvious example, you know, in Omaha, the Greek town massacre, but like, um, yeah, in which, you know, like, what are you going to say about that? I mean, the whole town gets wiped out. That's pretty, that's, yeah. that's as brutal as it gets, right? That's a great yeah. example. Um, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. I mean, I'm just saying that's as brutal as it gets, right? So that that's like, there's no like, well, yeah, but no, like, they, 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 yeah. they, yeah. They, 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 or, or yeah. deportations, right? This is one of the things that um, I'm hoping to look at in my dissertation. You know, um, common experiences of the deportation, and actually, Sibel Fox talks about this in her book, Three Worlds of Relief. Mm -hmm. You know, she mentions that along with you know the the en masse deportation of Mexicans uh, in the 30s, you had um, you know a large enough. I, I believe I don't want to misquote her, but I off the top of my head. You know the the the, the number twenty percent is coming to mind right now, uh, where southeastern European immigrants, um, you know, and uh, that raised my eyebrows as well. <laughs> you know, when I first read it, I was like, you know, this is this is interesting, and I actually have it footnoted to go back and look at it further uh, as I proceed here. But you know, um, it's like I'm looking for those similarities. Uh, and the reason I'm looking for those similarities is because in, as part of my dissertation, I want to try to, uh, like I said, position this Im immigrant group, uh, help people understand, you know, from a historical standpoint, pre-World War II, as you said, you know, what the, ex the experiences were uh, that they had and, and the commonalities and differences uh, with other immigrant and migrant and resident groups in the United States. Uh, I think it's important for us to contextualize that so that people in the present to some degree can look back and kind of reflect upon, you know, the importance uh, of that position, uh, right. not just in this particular immigrant group, but in general, um, you know, I think it will, it, it's helpful for, you know, descendants of, of European immigrants, um, you know, to really understand like where their ancestors were, were uh, socially, economically, racially um, um, positioned uh, yeah. in society at the time. Because like you said, the trajectories, you know, to the present, you know, those, those, trajectory, those trajectories begin somewhere, right? So where's that beginning point, you know, and what, you know, what really helps to um, form and frame uh, the present, you know, it, it begins at that origin. So uh, that's part of what my work is trying to do. Right. Uh, well, the, the, the other the other example that comes to mind when I think about European immigrants, you know, suffering in the United States, um, would be um, the mass lynching of Italians in New Orleans, right? And so, like, when you look at things like people getting lynched, you look at like an entire towns being razed and burned to the ground. I mean, it really doesn't get worse than that. So, I mean, that is that is on par with anything, right? But at the same time, you look at post World War II, you look at the GI Bill, you look at who was able to get into that and who wasn't. Yeah. That's when the differences begin. I mean, like, so I don't know. I don't know of a of a situation of Italians getting redlined. I don't know of a situation yeah. of Greeks being redlined. I don't know of Greek schools in the United States after the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and we were like, you know, oh, the Greeks can't come to school with us. I don't know those things. I mean, I know plenty of examples of Mexican schools. I know plenty of examples of separate but equal, you know, black schools. I know plenty of examples of like, you know, um, Indian boarding schools. I mean, those are that's, so that's kind of a different. That's different. Absolutely. And that's, I completely agree. And th this is, that's what I mean. Like even prior to World War II, right? In the examples that you mentioned of Italians and, and Greeks, you know, the Omaha massacre that you, you brought up is a good example of the lynching of Italians in New Orleans, you know, you know, we're really talking about like one or two data points here, you know, versus hundreds, <laughs> you know, thousands of okay. data points, you know? 
uh, for for African Americans, for Latinos, you know, for Native Americans, uh, and um, you know, for Asian Americans in the United States, the 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 uh, camps, the Japanese camps, you know, that uh, the internment camps. Um, it just it, it it just isn't on that scale, you know, and that's one of the things that my work emphasizes for sure. Um, but I have been I have been able to uncover some things, right? So uh, we talk about redlining, no. Absolutely not. You know, it just doesn't exist in the experiences of, you know, the immigrant group that I'm studying. But what does exist is like discrimination and and m motivation to discriminate against, um, for example, Turks, right, uh, in the early 20th century. So um, the um, University of Minnesota is doing great work on this. Uh, a, gr a research group there. Uh, has started a project that's kind of tracing all the um, residential uh, restrictive covenants, and they found, you know, a multitude of cases of Turks being uh, um, obstructed from purchasing property uh, throughout Minnesota. This is what I mean by like individual data points, right? Um, that actually piqued my interest a little bit. I looked into it a little bit more as well, and I found a work done by. Uh, a master's student at, uh, in Portland, at the University of Port Portland. Um, you know, her, her work shows like one restrictive covenant, you know, in the city of Portland affecting Greeks, okay? Um, in Seattle, you know, uh, restrictive covenants against, uh, um, uh, against uh, uh, Mongolians. And I have to kind of, I have to kind of contextualize that because like, in the early 20th century, what it, the term Mongolian, you know, could refer to a lot of different groups. It was a racial group you know, during that time, and the the Dillingham Commission, you know, did its played its role in in you know really in establishing uh, or helping to uh, justify and and um, you know really buttress these racial categories, so that when they were used in society. You know, people felt more um, um, more comfortable or more confident using them, right? Uh, at the time, so when somebody said Mongolian, well, that could mean you know uh, um, any member of the Mongolian race. What did that mean back then? It meant you know anyone from Asia, and Asia meant Turkey too. So, well, if so I always thought that when they said uh, Mongol, Mongolian, or I mean, and, and part of me, I'm not, I'm just quoting. So I'm gonna, when they would use those racial terms, Mongoloid, I always thought that that referred to like Chinese, Koreans, well, yes. I didn't realize that that also dips into yes. the Black Sea into Arabs. So, and, so this but, is one of the things that I think like was used in proxy, right? Uh, I and this is one of the things I'm researching still, so I can't say with full confidence, but um, you know the. Uh, there was a, 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 a an Asian barred region established by the 1917 Immigration Act, which was largely based upon the work of the Dillingham Commission. You know, and in that, and if uh, you know, I, I I got a hold of a map of what that actually meant. Um, you know, and Turkey was part of that region. You know, so if that was the barred Asiatic region, Turkey was part of it. Uh, so you have a lot of people who would immigrate to the United States from parts of Turkey that would, you know, for for one reason or another, they would identify as ethnic Greek or ethnic Armenian, you know, or any type of Christian minority from the Ottoman Empire. And they were Turkish, they were Ottoman Turkish citizens, you know, so um, that was what was written on the original government documents, you know, what was recorded on the census, uh, that that's what their, that was their place of birth. So one of the questions I've always had, you know, in seeing this this documentation and now coming across this data in Portland, Seattle, and um, you know Minneapolis, Minnesota, is well, what was the what was the concentration of Greeks or ethnic Greeks that lived there, you know, and did they really experience discrimination? Were they blocked and obstructed from uh, from acquiring uh, residences in in these um, cities and towns? I can't say for certain, you know, I do, I do see, I did these other research, it's a metadata analysis that I did, so I can't really speak for them directly, but according to their own data, the historians that have done this work, you know, they've showed that, they've shown that uh, at least the restrictive covenants exist, and on the restrictive covenants, you know, there's like one case or 
that's what I'm saying. Very few data points, but like one case or two cases, you know, of of um, you know being obstructed and acquiring uh, a resonance. But in com again, nowhere near compared to you know the experience of African Americans, of Native Americans, of Latinos, you know, being Asian Americans being barred from um, you know experiencing that that obstruction. Um, but still, I think like. Why is that important to know, right? I mean, it's important to know because it, it helped, again, on that trajectory, what's the origin? What's the origin point? Um, yeah, I mean, they in these few instances, you know, they were blocked from, pick, you know, finding a house somewhere in the, in the city of Portland, like one place in the city of Portland or one neighborhood, rather, in the city of, of uh, Portland, you know, or two neighborhoods in the city of Seattle. Um, from the University of Minnesota, it seems to be much more pronounced, like throughout Minneapolis, uh, for Turks. Um, but I don't know what how that translates, you know, in real time on the ground, uh, and how people really have, you know, dealt with that in one way or another on a daily basis in these in, in these interpersonal interactions that they had with landlords or you know, loan, loan officers, you know, builders, I have no idea. Um, but, you know, at present, you know, if we look back upon that time, it's okay, well, you know, it, it, it did exist, you know, uh, it, it did happen, but just at a very minute scale uh, when compared to uh, um, other groups, other social groups, other racial groups in, in, in U.S. society. Um, I think that's an important thing for descendants of those of those immigrants to know, yeah. you know, to know that although they were different, you know, the magnitude was much, much, much smaller. Um, it did exist, right? And by the way, that puts us as immigrants, as descendants of those immigrants, now in a group that can relate to people who were, you know, really discriminated against you know, really obstructed from, you know, living in, in certain parts of cities and towns and, and obtaining loans. And, you know, you know, it, and in many cases, like, that's important because now you can sympathize. Now you can empathize with people. You know, you could see, you could hopefully see their side. Um, and, you know, at in the present, make more, you know, make more sympathetic uh, decisions. Um, political and social uh, that will hopefully help people uh, instead of, you know, harming them in some way. Right. In the present. Well, what I think is really uh, uh, dangerous about the, um, around uh, false equivalencies is just the politicization of the false equivalencies. You know, like, so that, you, know, you know, we were discriminated against, need not apply, but look, like my, my uncle came here with two pennies and now look at us, right? What's wrong with you? And, that, that, that's when it gets it, but, but I'm really interested in the, in the in the information itself, right? And just like, okay, this is you know, this is not 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 an often covered thing. But I'm also interested in the position of people today, because when we talk about the census, right? On the census, we're, we're we're told that that there are people who are kind of I don't know how to describe it, technically white, off white, sort of white, whitish, you know, like so, Armenians are white according to census, um, Iranians are white according to census, a whole group of people, Arabs are white according to census. And you're talking about like groups of people that actually are in Asia, right? Uh, or, or actually technically, geographically are in this part of the world called Asia. Um, so I'm really interested in like how did that develop and how did that like, because when you describe like, you know, anti-Asian discrimination, like that would be like on a piece of paper, you know, that would say like, you know, Asians can't live in this neighborhood. In my mind, historically in the United States of America, Asia means China, Japan, Korea, yeah, yeah. Like that kind of area of the world. Um, and then, like you, when you say like, I know that Iran's in Asia, but if I, w I wouldn't say like that Asian guy over there, you know, like that that wouldn't be <laughs> that wouldn't be where my mind would go, right? Yeah. So yeah. like, um, I was specifically I was it, like, Iranian. And it right? didn't then, it, and it didn't to a great extent uh, then either in the mm -hmm. early 20th century, as far as I I can tell, so far at least from the research that I've done and the readings that I've done, um, you know, I don't think. I don't think that it did really signify Armenians uh, or Greeks, you know, or ethnic Armenians, ethnic Greeks, um, to the in the same magnitude that it did, um, you know, Chinese nationals, Japanese nationals, Korean nationals, um, for sure. 
Uh, you know, but I think that it all, it all depended on who was making that decision. Mm -hmm. Right. I, it all depended on, it all depended on who, I don't know who the landlord was in this case, in this example that we're using. Right. Um, so yeah, in that one neighborhood in Portland, you know, there was a there was a restrictive covenant. But then you're talking about the rest of the city and like literally, you know, Ottoman Greeks or Greeks in general or Armenians, other people who might be seen as Asian by like one person or you know, two people, you know, part of that group uh that should be othered or 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 discriminated against. You know, you had the rest of this, they could go live anywhere, everywhere, <laughs> you know. So uh, to answer your your question, like, yeah, I mean even then, like in the, in, in the early 20th century, I don't think, you know, there's evidence for Armenians, uh, for sure, for Syrians, um, you know, for example, being discriminated against by the uh, criminal justice system, being blocked from gaining citizenship. I'm talking about uh, Ian Hanny Lopez's book um, on the prescriptive cases uh, as an example. I call, I mean, I'm calling upon that right now. Um, you know, so they had to basically prove that they were white to a judge, um, you know, and if the judge felt, and you had these, these interesting back and forth. So like one judge would say, you know, this Syrian person in 19, 1911 is white enough to be an American citizen. And then, you know, five years later, a different judge in a different case would call a different Syrian national, not white enough, you know, to be, to be a, uh, an American citizen. Syria is again, you know, in that Asiatic barred zone that becomes, uh, you know, part of U.S. law in 1917. Um, so, uh, you know, there's definitely some evidence of, of that existing. And I think it, that's why I said earlier, like, it's really the eye of the beholder, right? Who is in the position of power and how, how uh, free are there to, to wield that power? Um, and ultimately, you know, the definition fell upon them to decide, uh, specifically in this case, in the example I just gave. Uh, but uh, I think that might have, that was definitely a more general trend, right? I mean, if, like I said, if you were a landlord in this one neighborhood in Portland, you know, yeah, you for you, that restrictive covenant was important. It was important to keep Greeks out, right? If you were the landlord or the builder, I guess, or the loan officer uh, in Minneapolis in those specific sections of the city where Turks were a part of the restrictive covenants, yeah, it made sense for you to, re to, to discriminate against them. Um, so, yeah, I think that for sure, though, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, the idea of Mongoloid or Mongolian you know, primarily labeled people from Turkey or primarily labeled people from uh, Syria or Armenia, um, who are Armenian nationals, Syrian nationals, Greek nationals, Ottoman nationals, you know. Uh, I think that in, in, the, in the racist imagination of, of nativists, restrictionists during the early 20th century, I think it would apply more so to um, Chinese nationals, Japanese nationals, Korean nationals, and to a lesser extent, uh, Persian nationals, to a lesser extent, you know, the farther west you went, you know, in that, in that Asiatic barred zone, um, you know, the less I would say probably apply to you, but I, I'm going, that's speculation. You know, I can't really speak to it directly with, you know, numbers, uh, at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, another example that would come to mind is, um, I mean, things that we don't even think about in terms of ethnic struggle, but like if you look at um, like the Ludlow Massacre, right? So that's like, you know, some of the names there, to Co Costa, Costa, Ticas, you know, um, a lot of Mexicans too, but and some Italians, but like that was kind of, I mean, like, so you can see the proletarian nature of what, of the position of Greece at the time. I mean, like, it's, it's, it's Rockefeller killing Costa. It's not Costa killing Rockefeller. It's... It's 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 are it's are the Greeks white being answered by Smith, not are the Smiths white being answered by Costa. You know, it's not it's not the other way around. So absolutely, kind of, yeah, you're absolutely right about that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, but I want I want to talk about your specific work though. You're talking about Ottoman Greeks. So you, you're doing this work on Ottoman Greeks. Like, who is an Ottoman Greek? Is an Ottoman Greek an ethnic Greek from the Ottoman Empire, or is an Ottoman Greek? somebody from the uh, uh, Ottoman Empire who went into Greece? Like, what, what, uh, 
I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> you know, this is this is a question that is kind of tied to my own uh, identity um, um, journey, right? I'm trying to. Uh, there are the 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 work that I'm doing for my dissertation kind of uh, touches upon this. This is the this I would say t doesn't touch upon it. This is like one of the central questions I have. You know, who is an Ottoman Greek? Um, did they see themselves as Ottoman Greek, these immigrants? Uh, and if they did, how did that really translate on a daily basis? But it, and if they didn't, um, what did they see this, themselves as? Um, now the, the, uh, the dissertation is gonna kind of try to get at that by looking at a combination of sources. I'm looking at newspaper articles, I'm looking at interviews uh, that I'm conducting that are part of the, the project that's the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program um, but aren't, um, that, those interviews contain a lot more information than just, you know, questions about identity. Um, so, you know, there, there's a whole component to that project that has nothing to do with what I'm doing, but I'm still doing the interviews because all of that information is going to ultimately live, um, you know, as part of the collection of the Samuel Proctor World History Program. Different researchers can use it for different reasons. They could reinterpret my work too. You know, but ultimately, there's a lot more information in there besides identity and how, you know, people perceived identity. But that's one of the questions, I, that's some of the questions I have in there, you know, about identity, about how, uh, you know, the, um, the first generation really viewed itself. Um, you know, what kinds of labels do they use to describe themselves to others? Um, this is what I'm trying to get at with the interviews. And the, uh, the same question, I'm asking the same question but I'm asking it of like documents too. So I'm looking at the Ellis Island Archive uh, Foundation ship manifest records. I'm looking at uh, newspaper ar archival sources that were both in Greek uh, printed in the United States um, and English printed in the United States and trying to see if there's you know any information there uh, and compare those sources. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking for the, the narratives that I talked about earlier, the stereotypes, the narratives, you know, what, what, what were they, um, you know, existing literature tells that, tells us that for sure. But, um, you know, I'm also looking to see like, kind of to, to see remnants of, uh, those, uh, indicators rather of those stereotypes in the, the written record in the newspaper archives, for, for example, um, and then to compare labels, stereotypes, narratives about identity to what the um, descendants of immigrants uh, remember their, uh, the first generation really passing down to them. Uh, so there's a component of memory uh, theory in this, uh, in this uh, dissertation as well. Um, and uh, to answer your question, um, on paper, so far, what I what I can say with a little with some confidence is that on paper, you know, what people put down on paper didn't always uh, uh, correspond to what they told their peer groups, and that's pretty. That should be expected, right? I mean, yeah. we all do that. <laughs> you know, we all do to some degree. We all do that. We all, you know, identify one way to government authorities, and then you know, when it comes to uh, our peer groups, uh, social occasions we have, you know, we. Uh, we identify a completely different way uh, to our and to our families. Um, so, and and nationality and race, um, you know, are not the only identifiers either. I mean, we identify as so many different things, you know. So, and many of those identities have much more salience in our lives than, you know, our nationality or race. Um, but uh, for many of us, they don't. You know, there are more. Um, you know, those are really salient in our lives, those are really important. Uh, so uh, when it comes to Ottoman Greeks and, you know, their identity, as far as I can tell, there's a disparity. You know, it depends on, it depends on the occasion. I mean, there, there definitely is indication of uh, um, discrimination, you know, prejudice uh, between uh, Greeks from Greece and uh, Greeks that were coming from the Ottoman Empire or those that would identify themselves as ethnic Greeks as coming from the Ottoman Empire. Um, and then on paper, you definitely have like a pronounced difference. Um, you know, there's Ottoman citizens, Ottoman nationals, uh, Turkish nationals who have Greek as their race. Um, and, you know, that's like 
from from a pilot study I did, uh, that is about sixty percent, um, sixty sixty five percent of the of the population uh, that I looked at in a sample of about fifteen hundred people. You know, twenty percent were like Greek nationals with Greek uh, race. Uh, and then the rest were Turkish nationals with Turkish race. So on paper, th this is how they identify. And then if you look at the names, though, you're you're reading like what we what we would consider to be ethnically Greek names, like George Topolitas, you know, an ethnically Greek name, uh, you know. But George Topolitas might be a Turkish national, you know, an Ottoman national uh, of Greek race. So uh, you know that that's that's as far as the the ship manifest can take me. Uh, and then the, the newspapers and the, and the interviews tell a, a completely different story. You know, they tell a story about, um, you know, assimilating into uh, Greek, uh, uh, Greekness. Uh, they tell that story. Uh, they also tell a story about, you know, pride in Greekness, you know, feeling, uh, feeling expressing Greekness, you know, Greek identity, uh, being proud of that, um, you know, openly uh, in public. Um, you know, that's another, uh, that's another narrative, uh, that appears in, in the interviews that appears in the newspaper archives as well. Um, what I haven't been able to find directly yet is, you know, any, any direct rejection, you know, of, uh, Greekness, Americanness as a whole, um, in part, you know, but not as a whole, like, people proudfully saying that they're Turkish or proudfully saying that they're Ottoman, for example. Um, that is something that in the interviews um, just hasn't appeared. Um, and I think that uh, I have, I speculate as to why at this point, um, but, you know, I think it has to do with the, the, the legacy of the genocide, you know, at, at the hands of the Ottoman Empire, the uh, Ottoman uh, regime back then. Um, you know, just even the term, I mean, if you, <laughs> if you go to the, the Facebook page that we have, you know, even the term Ottoman, you know, it's, it's such a contentious term to this, to this day because of that legacy, uh, because of the legacy of that genocide, um, you know, and you see people reacting to it, you know, opposing it, you know, not being, not being want, not wanting to be identified as it, as that particular term, um, you know, and uh, because of its links to the to the legacy of the genocide, and something I understand because this this is what I grew up in as well. You know, I, I completely understand where that where that comes from, um, and I completely sympathize with it uh, as well. Um, but the but the name of the project actually comes from the the you know the written documentation. Um, right. This is what they claimed on paper. Right. Uh, so that's where I I drew. Uh, you know, the inspiration for the project name. Um, and no, I'm sorry. No, it's just an interesting thing, though, because like, you talk about the fact that, you know, they don't want to be associated with the Ottoman. Uh, some people don't want to be associated with the, the Ottoman Empire, it's particularly this idea of Ottoman Empire at that period of time. Um, it's really interesting because, you know, like the identification of an Ottoman Greek as opposed to just a Greek who just so happened to live somewhere else actually comes from the Greek nationals themselves. I mean, who, who, who like, you're an Ottoman Greek, you're not a real Greek. Like, I mean, I, I mean, so much from my yes. like, conversations we had. So I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's yes. like yeah, there's, a, this, this, there's evidence of this definitely in, in, ex, in the existing scholarship that, right, that is written about Greece mm -hmm. uh, during this time period in the early 20th century. Uh, and also things, and also um, from sources like newspapers that I've come across, uh, newspaper articles that I've come across, where yeah, that is a very pronounced uh, um, othering that occurred during the time. You know, your the the uh, Greek state narrative, you know, very much being used the the Greek state building narrative, very much being used to uh, draw distinctions between Greeks from Greece uh, and you know. Um, Ottoman citizens of Greek ethnicity uh, in the Ottoman Empire, whatever that means. Because, I mean, the, we talk about parts of the Ottoman Empire that are today part of Turkey, right? And that's such a diverse space. There are so many different people living there. Um, yeah, and they're Orthodox Christian, and some are Greek Orthodox Christian, and others were Armenian Orthodox Christian, and Assyrian Orthodox, and, it's, and Jews, and you know, Muslims, of course, you know, and it's like, okay, what does that all mean when they leave? 
right? And they immigrate to Greece. What does that all mean when they immigrate to the United States? Now there's like a reshuffling really of, you know, the, the, the magnitude that each identity, uh, the magnitude of importance that each identity has in the, in the daily life of an individual, you know, and it's like, uh, uh, you know, what, what does it actually mean to be an Ottoman uh, citizen uh, of Greek, you know, race, according to the ship manifests, in real life, in real time, on the ground, in the United, you know, in New York City, uh, in the early 20th century? What does that actually mean? Well, it means that there's people who are going to hear Turk or who are going to hear Ottoman, and it's going to raise their eyebrows, especially if you're in that Greek enclave, right? They're going to look at you and say, well, you know, I don't know about that whole Ottoman thing. Um, you know, we're Greek, yes, and American, you know, for sure. Uh, but, you know, Ottoman is one of those things, that term that, and especially with the genocide and, and the legacy of the genocide uh, in, in view as well, you know, that term very quickly becomes, you know, stigmatized and, and you know, people are turning away for, from it. Um, uh, in order to uh, to assimilate, you know, in order to not to not be bothered by the politics and you know the uh, the nationalism of the time, and really just focus on uh, you know finding a position in the socioeconomic you know uh, stratification of U.S. society at the time. Um, that that I think arguably would be more would would have been more important to them than you know regularly arguing about you know what whether they were ottoman or greek or it, it was it was a time of of that population just trying to establish itself i think yeah. um so uh yeah i think that um there was definitely this uh antagonism uh you know there's evidence for that like i said uh and i've been able to uncover some evidence too that uh, i'm going to write about in my dissertation um and in addition to that, though, the, like I said, the, the other narratives like, you know, Greekness, being proud of Greekness, that is also, uh, uh, you know, a salient narrative of the time. Um, and uh, also being, you know, proud of Americanness and American culture. So, uh, you know, those are all the different uh, um, narratives that I've come, I've come across uh, through my, through at least this point in my research. That's really, that's really, that's, it's been, this has been a great hour. I mean, I know I've taken up a more of your time than I anticipated, but I do, we do have a question from the audience. Do you want to, do you want to? Sure. All right. This question comes from Eva Topolitis. <laughs> George, can you share any stories from your interviews with descendants of Ottoman Greeks for your project that left a huge impression on you? Oh, wow. Uh, so, um. There, there have been so many uh, impactful um, stories, like where I've walked out of people's homes and I've been in tears. You know, like just unreal what people went through. Um, you know, not, and I'm not, and I'm not talking about just you know the Ottoman Empire or you know traumatic and tragic you know stories about leaving the Ottoman Empire, uh, but in the United States. Uh, one that I always uh, that always comes to mind when I'm asked this question uh, uh, is that um, story of a um, a grandmother and grandfather who are to be married, and the grandmother is uh, from Sparta. So this is the grandparents of a descendant who I interviewed, and um, you know the grandmother is from Sparta, and the grandfather is. Uh, originally from uh, a town in Western um, Turkey on the Black on the on the Aegean Sea coast, uh, the town is called Alachata, um, and you know they're to be married. And the great grandmother of the Spartan uh, grandmother uh, finds out that this marriage is going to occur. So. Um, you know, as soon as she finds out, she goes to her daughter, uh, the grandmother, and says, uh, I didn't bring you to the United States so you could marry a Turk. 
Um, and, you know, I say it and my hair still stands on end every time I say it. But this gentleman, I mean, in, in, in interviewing, you know, that side of the family, the, the grandfather side of the family, I learned that this gentleman, you know, for all intents and purposes, would have been identified as someone who's ethnically Greek. You know, he was Greek Orthodox. Uh, he um, uh, he was born in Alachita, but you know, immigrated to Egypt first when he was four years old with his with his family, and then ultimately came to the United States. Um, you know, and uh, you wouldn't know, right? You wouldn't by hearing him speak or listen, you know, ask to ask him to talk about himself. You wouldn't know he was Turkish by any means, but the grand the great grandmother knew, you know, and she she made sure that. Her, 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 her daughter, you know, would not, she wasn't happy about what was about to happen. Um, interestingly enough, I learned through it, another inter through the interview process that the grand, the great, that the grandfather, uh, who was going to be part of the groom in this marriage, uh, you know, regularly, uh, um, sang in Turkish, you know, when he had a little too much to drink, you yeah. know, he would, he would, he would, this would be his reminiscence, you know, he would sing in Turkish and, uh, you know, just, I guess, reminisce about the, you know, his life that he lived in, in Turkey and Egypt, um, you know, and uh, I found that to be interesting because it's like, okay, well, on the one hand, you wouldn't think this person, if you spoke to him, you wouldn't think that he was, you know, from Turkey for, you know, ethnic Greek in every way, right? And yet, like, this, he kept this piece, of his childhood, his four years, you know, uh, in in Ottoman uh, uh, Ottoman ruled in the Ottoman realm, you know, where the Ottoman Empire uh, uh, had its uh, its domains, uh, Egypt and and Turkey at the time, um, and that's how he kept connected, just in, in well into his uh, you know older years, because this is his you know his descendants, his grandchildren, basically telling telling me this story. You know, and he would he, they, that, that that's characteristic. They would make the the little shot glass. Uh, uh, you know, they was taking a shot glass of of raki, you know, or uh, alcohol, and uh, you know, singing in Turkish. And he loved to sing in Turkish. And uh, you know, they they accentuated that. Um, so, but you know, when it came to the marriage, what ended up happening was the great grandmother would not uh, would not go along. She didn't, they didn't have it in a church. You know, they had it at a family member's uh, house. The marriage, um, because they, you know, it wasn't attended by the great grandmother. She wasn't having it, um, but they did it anyway. The grandmother was like, "I don't care that you don't want him. Um, this is who I'm going to marry." <laughs> you know, um, so that's tip. You know, I've I've come across this type of story in like um, in a journal article recently that I read for for uh, a class where. Uh, you know, uh, Japanese nationals and Filipino nationals would, you know, it was looked down upon for them to intermarry. Um, um, that's, that's the one example that comes to mind, you know, but this, 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 uh, obstruction of intermarriage between ethnic groups, uh, you know, is very common, uh, for, uh, for other ethnic groups as well, you know, and not to speak of, not to even like touch upon, you know, inter interracial marriage, which is just like this experience again, like I said, the, the magnitude of it, right? Yeah, it's similar. Okay. But the government, like the U S government is not making a law, you know, to make it illegal. Okay. I mean, there's a similarity. Sure. You know, this, this, the, the racial, the racialized, the racist ideology is in the background. You know, the Turk is inferior. Okay. But you know, there isn't like a law, that requires a person to get like, you know, a whiteness certificate to be able to marry someone. So there's a big difference there, <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, and I think overall, if I were to kind of like, in a nutshell, describe my own research, not again, not the project, but my own research, uh, it would be that, you know, that, yeah, there, there are these small similarities, but we need to contextualize them, um, you know, within the broader scope of oppression. Um, you know, there are very, they're at the very bottom in magnitude uh, when compared to other, to other social groups in the United States. But that's still very interesting information. I mean, like, it was like, kind of like, you know, it's very, you know, it's not, not something we discuss every day. And I don't think that, um, 
the fact that it can be compared to something that's like you know quantitatively qualitatively worse doesn't necessarily mean it's not you know interesting or we're talking about or you know i think that and especially you know if no one else is really talking about or there's not that and it's not a huge field study so i mean yeah i completely agree and i think i think it's important for that reason too right it's important so that you know the groups that today would see themselves as you know originating from you know these these immigrant groups uh, in the early 20th century and i think it's important for for them to to be knowledgeable of this information of the similarities you know the mag the magnitude's different sure but you know your great grandparent you know had this in common you know this was the the race the rate like i said the racist ideology that's common you know yeah. it existed just on a different magnitude yeah well i mean it's different magnitude but at the same time like you, there's certain things that i don't know like I, it, you know, it, it, it depends what time period we're talking about. Like, and things are quantitative. Like, like for instance, like if I mentioned Ludlow Massacre, my great grandfather was a was a coal miner, right? So my great grandfather would die alongside Greeks. Had he been, had he been, my great grandfather was a coal miner actually in Colorado. It was a later period of time, but so like my great grandfather, if you know, there'd been like if he'd been older or my, you know, my great great grandfather, I don't know, uh, could have been shot alongside some Greeks. Where yeah. the difference yeah. is when you're getting to my grandfather and my father and me. And then you, then then the story kind of changes, right? Yes. But um, but like just be, that doesn't make that 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 doesn't mean it's it's not history. It's not interesting. I mean, it's not. Yeah, I cool. completely agree. I completely agree. Yeah, yeah. Well, I really appreciate this hour we got spent together. Um, an hour plus. Uh, where can people find out more about your work, George? Yeah. So um, definitely uh through the uh, Facebook page, Ottoman Greeks of the United States, um. That's one place. Uh, there, there's a website as well um, through UF. If you search UF Ottoman Greeks of the United States, um, you know there's a web page that will lead you to all the different components of the project. Um, my own research, um, unfortunately, is not available yet. You know, I'm, uh, I'm still in the process of uh, collecting data for my own research, and uh, hopefully that by the end of 2021. Uh, I will be in a position, in a better position, to publish my my dissertation than I am right now. Um, but the project, yeah, the project is already up. There's actually a museum, a component of that, um, you know, is can be found through the uh, through the website. Uh, we're building that still, so there's only a couple of entries so far. But if you go to um, the um, there's a UF digital collection uh, page. Uh, that you can find online if you search Ottoman Greeks of the United States um, Digital Collection, Uni University of Florida Digital Collection, Ottoman Greeks of the United States. Um, you will find uh, the information that we've uploaded so far. Interestingly enough, it was very recent, the upload and the, the first upload. And it was of three ledgers uh, of an organization in Los Angeles uh, that, ex that uh, was established in 1909 uh, by immigrants from the island of Manmara, which is... Uh, uh, south uh, east of Istanbul and uh, you know this this organization is um, from what I from what I'm gathering from what I know from my research the first uh, or organization to be set up set up in the United States by ethnic Greeks from uh, the Ottoman Empire um, so there's three ledgers there and it's a you know the minute the minute meaning the, the meeting minutes and you know, uh, memberships, and it's actually a very interesting uh, set of documents because it kind of gives insight into that time period uh, directly from the eyes of the members of the organization. So uh, that's that's there now, and soon we'll be uploading more photographs, documents uh, that I, that our researchers that are part of the project have collected uh, over the course of the interviews that we've that we've conducted. And we have over two hundred interviews. Uh, thus far, so it's you know a decently a decent size project, um, but you know we're con it's an ongoing project too. So we're continuing to uh, collect data and collect uh, experiences, uh, and um, you know hopefully it'll give an opportunity not just for researchers to connect with this information for their own work, but uh, with descendants, um, you know, to learn more about uh, their their heritage. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time, George, uh, and we'll drop the links below and um, talk soon. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate it.